My name is Jim Durst. And uh, if you are a visitor today, hmm, looking shy of visitors. But if you are, please fill out the yellow card so we have some idea on how to reach you. Because the important thing is we have a mission. And we have a mission to welcome people. We have a mission to bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. And so together we invite all to faith in Jesus Christ and growth in discipleship through word, prayer, and service. Um, Sunday, July 28th, so two weeks from today, our executive presbyter, Reverend Elizabeth Schultz, will be here with us in worship and will be preaching. So that'll be a good chance for you to meet her and hear her and uh, welcome her to UCPC. The reason she's able to more be here and it works real smooth is Pastor Erica is scooting out the door to Minnesota for a continuing education conference. And um, so for pastoral care needs while she is away, contact the church office to be connected to a deacon or another local pastor for care needs. Are there other announcements? Tonight, seven o'clock <clears throat> at the UAF Davis Concert Hall is the festival uh, chorus concert, and it's the beginning really of the main part of the festival. But um, Joe has an amazing piece that he sings, <laughs> and Teresa and Roger and I are all in it. Um, there's gonna be music from Man of La Mancha, Les Mis, uh, Brigadoon, Lucky Stiffs, I can't remember all the others, and uh, some great Negro spirituals, so it'll be a lot of fun. Oh, I just wanted to say, if these are from the Illingsworth's farm, every Sunday, it's just amazing. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> Woman's Bible Study, tomorrow, chapter seven, 2.30 in the narthex. We hope to see you there. Okay. Will you rise and join me in the call to worship then? <clears throat> God calls. God gathers. God challenges. God moves. God liberates. God saves. Guide us in our lives, O oh Holy One, so all creation might flourish. Please pray with me. Almighty God, we thank you for planting in us the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive it with joy and live accordingly, that we may grow in faith and hope and love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our hymn of praise is Healer of Our Every Ill. Glory to God, 795, and the screen. Pain of joy. 
your vision, God of love. Healer of our every ill, light of each tomorrow, give us peace beyond our fear and hope beyond our strength to love each other, every sister, every brother, spirit of all kindness be our guide. Healer of our every ill, light of each tomorrow, but it can also be convicting. So let us honestly examine our hearts and confess our sins before Almighty God, beginning with a time of silent confession. Joining in our unison prayer confession, Holy God, we belittle ourselves in the face of overwhelming problems. We tell ourselves we are powerless to create positive change. We tell ourselves peace is impossible as we invest billions in weapons of war. We refuse new ideas, new solutions, new voices. We are stuck, trapped, in our comfortable ways. Forgive our reluctance, God. Forgive our ignorance. Forgive our excuse-making. Turn us to all that is possible through you. Amen. Christ has set us free. Claim your forgiveness. Rejoice in God's grace. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you now the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father. to share that sign of peace with those around you. Peace.
Let us pray. Prepare our hearts and minds for the hearing of your word, holy God. Open us to your truth. Humble us to your way. Amen. Reading from the Hebrew Bible comes to us from Amos, chapter 7, verses 7 to 15, pages 855 in the Old Testament section of your pew Bible. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line? Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise again with the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from this land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O oh, seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Next we read from the psalm, Psalm 85, verses 8 to 13 on Page 543. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the land, and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and will make a path for his steps. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Not yet, I'm going to need three to four brave volunteers who are willing to stand a little, a little crooked and be measured by God's plumb line, okay? So just, you know, think if you're in a good, you know, healthy mental space to be a little crooked in the way of God's word, okay? Just as an example, all right? Okay, hi! How are you doing today? I love your dino shirt. That's fun. I got the sneeze. You got the sneeze? Oh, man. Sometimes I get the sneezes, too. Usually I only sneeze twice, but my husband sneezes seven times. Every single time. How many times do you sneeze in a row? Four, four, five. You just sneeze once. There you go. Everybody's different. Well, do you know what this is? Have you ever seen that before? That is what we call a plumb line. It's used in like construction and carpentry to make, make sure that a wall is straight up and down or it's not like leaning in or leaning out. It's used by carpenters and construction workers to make sure that they're building properly. But in our story today that Jim read, God said that God was going to use a plumb line to measure God's people. Now, I think you and Margie 
are going to build some plumb lines, but I used some of our supplies from last week to make another one that we could use today to measure some people. Do you think you could help me measure some people? See how they're doing? Yeah? All right. Do we have any volunteers? No? Okay. All right. Yes. Come on up. Lean into your, your non-Lutheran sensibilities of saint and sinner. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. I'm going to, I'll measure, I'll measure um, Muffy, and then will you guys help measure our other example people? All right. Let's see. Is Muffy standing straight up and down? Maybe. Is she leaning forward? Here, come look from this angle. Does she look like she's tilting forward compared to our plumb line? Maybe. She looks pretty straight up and down, though. All right. Here, Hiram, can you measure Will? There we go. All right, measure Will. Is he straight up and down? Or is the plumb line closer on one side than the other? It might be closer to his shoulder than his, than his ankle. Hmm, maybe Will needs an adjustment. Whoop! Whoa! All right, Franklin, can you measure Miss Lois? Oh, all right, here we go. Okay. Franklin, can you bring it over here? Franklin and Harm, are you going to do it together? All right, let's measure Lois. Let's see. Hmm. Is she straight up and down? Or is the string maybe closer to her head? Yeah. Should we give her a little adjustment? Whoop. Ooh. All right, we got one more. Which way is he going to be? Oh. Oh, my. Curtis might need a big adjustment. <laughs> How do we help him out? Help him. Oh, yeah. There we go. Hey, thanks, volunteers. You guys are seriously saints. Yeah, so, so God says he's going to put a plumb line in our midst to see how we're doing. Are we, are we sticking with God or are we a little off skew? And some days are going to be better than others. But God is going to be keeping an eye on us and trying to help us out and make sure we're going the right direction. And God uses a plumb line to do that. A plumb line might not look like these cool popsicle sticks that you guys made the other week and the string, but it might look like a friend or a teacher. It could be a parent or someone at church or even me pointing something out, saying, hey, uh, should you be eating that popsicle? It's bedtime. You know, we, could, we get all kinds of... Um, ideas of ways we can do things differently from all sorts of different people. And we could think, oh, God's got God's plumb line working. So that's what this is. This is a plumb line. And while it's usually used in construction, God uses it in our lives too, by helping us know the right things to do. Would you pray with me? Dear Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for helping us know where we might be a little askew and how we can rectify that to be as close to you as possible. Thank you for loving us and supporting us and being with us even when we are a little askew. Thank you for never abandoning us and for being with us always. God, we ask that you help us as we go forth from this day to know how best to be close to you. And all God's kids said, amen. All right, I think you're going to make some plumb lines and measure some walls. So go have fun. Our gospel reading is from Mark, the sixth chapter, beginning in verse 14. King Herod heard of the disciples' preaching, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer had been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And still others said, 
It is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard it, he said, It is John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent out men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and so John protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? Her mother replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately, the daughter rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the gospel of our Lord. Ooh. Grace and peace to you from the one who was, the one who is, and the one who is to come. Wow. Between this text and what happened yesterday to our, our former president and our presidential candidate, uh, Mr. Trump, it's, it's got a lot of violence going on this weekend in our, our narratives, both at church and in the world. That can be hard and heavy, and whatever emotions um, you may be feeling, please know that emotions are good and healthy, and they urge us to listen to our bodies and our guts it's just maybe what we do with our emotions that isn't quite so healthy. Amos. Our story today in Amos describes an interaction between God and Amos, talking about a plumb line. A plumb line being set in the midst of God's people. And God says, with this plumb line, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but with this plumb line, I will never again pass my people by. I will never again pass my people by. Well, in the, the rest of the text, they go on to hear that Israel is going to be exiled, that the sanctuaries are going to be plundered and destroyed and looted and burned. It's not the most prettiest of pictures for Israel post plumb line. Never again will I pass my people by. A um, simple, less dramatic example is from when I lived in Greece. I don't know if I've mentioned, but I spent a year in Greece in undergrad. And while there, I learned about a different way of existing on the streets while you're walking or sitting. And that is, it is impolite to not stare at people. That it is seen as a compliment if you are being stared at, because it means that you are actually interesting and worthy of being taken notice of. So if no one is looking at you, that's when you got to go home and reassess your life because you're doing something wrong. You're too boring for the world or you're, you know, hideous or something, you know. And I was very uncomfortable with that at first, especially, you know, the, the old grandpas sitting there having their coffee, just staring at you as you walk to go buy your bread. It, it's a little unnerving at first. But after a few months, I got used to it. 
I came home. <laughs> and I'm still in a little bit of reverse culture shock 10 years later of like, wait, you mean I can't just stare at someone on the street because they're really interesting or nobody's looking at me? Why? I have a cute dress on. But that discomfort at first, never again will I let my people be passed, never again will I pass my people by. That's God sitting on the streets in Greece, staring intently at every person that walks past, noticing, taking it in, whether that's uncomfortable or not. A much more intentional and intimate kind of relationship than us Americans on the street of don't look, don't look, yeah, they have a cool orange hat on, but don't look, don't look. So in a way, when God is saying, never again will I pass my people by, what God is saying is, I'm going to take notice. I'm not going to let things get swept under the rug anymore. I will notice the good and the bad because I love my people. Never again will I pass my people by. So yeah, if God is really noticing us, if God is really paying attention to us, then some things we might not want to have be seen are going to be seen. And when God says, never again will I pass my people by, that means that those things we wish could just get swept under the rug will no longer be ignored. Have any of you ever seen the show NCIS? Okay, all right. So for those who don't know, it's a Naval Criminal Investigative Services or something along those lines. It's a TV show where they investigate uh, the, usually the deaths of, of naval and marine officers or, or people. And there's one main agent, Agent Gibbs, and he is tough on his agents. He has very strict code of rules, the things that have to be done, um, and she's got, I don't know, like 60-some rules, and they all have to have them memorized. Often these rules are, if you think you're being played, you are, or there's no such thing as coincidences. But these are the kinds of rules that Agent Gibbs has, as well as, you know, always be available, be reachable, those kinds of things. Well, through the seasons, he loses some of his agents, and that makes him start to question whether his teaching methods, his rules, really are actually helpful, or if that's why he's losing these agents. So when he gets a new one, he goes easy on her. Not that she knows it, or even we know it at first, but he goes easy on her. Until it comes to light from an evaluation where she gets a really good score, and everyone's like, ooh, that's not good, you're not supposed to get a good score. And it comes to a head. She confronts him. Why, did, why are you going easy on me? And that's when we learn that he is second-guessing whether or not the way that he's pushing his agents is actually helpful. Now this agent, not to give you any spoilers, but she loves to sit on the floor, crisscross applesauce, spread her papers out, and, and really get into the evidence. So after this confrontation, she immediately sits back down to get back to work, and he's like, nope, you have to sit at your desk. The floor is for standing or walking. She's like, no, wait, that's not what I meant when I didn't want you to go easy on me anymore. <laughs> Never again will I pass you by. Yes, I'm going to push you. I'm no longer going to go easy on you because I want you to be the best. I want you to be the best that you can possibly be. So yes, I'm going to push you. Yes, it's going to be hard, but it's going to be worth it. Now, the, the Israelites in our Amos text might be hearing your sanctuary is ruined, you be sent into exile, and go, okay, God, but that's a little too much. That's a little too much. Can't we have a little bit easier of a redirect? And I would probably be asking the same question as well. Do I have to be exiled? Do my safe spaces have to be destroyed? Does the place where I find you and worship you have to become desolate? 
we don't actually get reconciliation or restitution. We don't get healing for this group of Israelites in this text. It's only centuries later that there are stories of how much God loves this remnant, that, they, that God would go to the ends of the earth and scoop up every bone of the, this deceased group to bring them back into the fold. It takes centuries but there is still a glimmer of hope, even for those in this story. Our gospel text also seems to have a, not a whole lot of hope in it. John the Baptist, this awesome disciple of Christ who is preparing the way, is, is acting as that first plumb line that we could point to in our texts today. Pointing out to Herod, how he might be living outside of God's will or God's rules. And he's killed for it. And then his head is put on a platter, a silver platter. There's not a whole lot of hope there, it seems. If we too are, are living into God's call to, to support one another, to call one another out, to love one another... Does that mean we too will be beheaded and our head placed on a silver platter? Maybe. Hopefully not. But our gospel text shows a whole lot of unhealthy family dynamics in Herod's family. That he has taken his brother's wife and married her while the brother is still alive. The wife is, is trying to, to take it out on this person who is calling them out on this sin that they are living in. The daughter who is performing a dance and her dad asks, what do you want? I'll give it to you. And instead of saying, I want 15 jars of lollipops, her mom tells her, ask for someone to be killed. The daughter then ups the ante. The mom says nothing about a head on a platter. The daughter adds that in. As though, ooh, okay, maybe mom will be really proud of me if I add in this extra piece. What an unhealthy family dynamic. And poor Herod, he's like, but this guy, you know, I don't really like him, but I also don't want to kill him, but I have to because I made this oath in front of all these people. That's a tough place to be. It's an unhealthy family dynamic, and I feel for Herod. I feel for him. Especially because in verse 16, when we hear how Herod responds to learning that, that Jesus is at work in the world, Herod isn't able to hear that it's actually Jesus. What he understands Jesus as is John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. Herod is still processing the trauma, the, the grief, the horror of having killed someone he looked up to, even if he disagreed with him. He's still processing that guilt, that weight, that shame, that, that realization that he has done wrong. And he is so caught up in it that that is forefront in his mind. That he cannot hear that it is actually someone else. That it is the child of God come into his midst. He is so bogged down by his own sin that he cannot hear that it is Jesus. And that's why we get this flashback. We get to hear, you know, okay, so we hear John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. But we haven't heard the story of, of how Herod did that. So we get this, back, this flashback. John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. But it's actually Jesus. How often might we as well be so bogged down by our own guilt, our own shame, our own sins, that we too can't really 
Jesus in our midst. That we too can't see the presence of Christ among us. That we too are led to behead whatever it is that seems to threaten the, the security that we have right now. John the Baptist was acting as a plumb line in the midst of Herod's life, calling him to correct course, to change directions, to do something different. Maybe we too do the same thing. When someone calls us out, we shut them down, we sh or shut them out. Because it's hard. To hear those truths, it's hard to be called out. It's hard to realize we made a mistake or are doing something in an incorrect way. It's hard. And it can be easy to want to cut the head off that plumb line and just ignore the problem altogether. But our ultimate plumb line the ultimate thing that can, that can help guide us, call us out, draw us in, love us, is Jesus. And you know what? They tried to kill Jesus too, but it didn't stick. He came back. And he will keep coming back. No matter how many times we throw him up on a cross, Jesus will keep coming coming back for you, for me, for anyone in need. Because that is the sticky love of Jesus, the resilient, tangible love of God. That means even if it takes centuries to gather our bones together to draw us back in, we will be drawn back in. We will be gathered together with God again that plumb line will ultimately correct our course. Keep us from leaning one way or that, when really we should just be heading forward with Christ. May you, if you are a plumb line in someone else's life, have strength and courage and conviction to keep being a plumb line. And if you are being plumbed, may you have the humility, openness, and vulnerability to hear it and welcome the presence of Christ in your midst. Amen. Our hymn of affirmation is Spirit of God, Descend Upon My Heart, number 688.
Join with me as we affirm our faith from a brief statement of faith. Together, let us profess. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people, to live as one community. But we rebel against God. We hide from our Creator, <clears throat> ignoring God's commandments. We violate the image of God in others and ourselves, accept lies as truth, exploit neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the planet entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation. Yet God acts with justice and mercy to redeem creation. In everlasting love, the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant. Like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. You may be seated. In gratitude to God for all our blessings, let us bless others with a portion of what we have been given. Let us present our offerings to God. You have blessed us with gifts to serve and share. May the offerings we present today be used to promote the peace, justice, and healing you desire for us and your world. Amen. Please be seated. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. 
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy God, you made the word to hum in harmony. You listened and you called it good. In time, we broke off from singing the song and went our own way. But you called us back. And when the time was right, you came in flesh and blood to live as one of us. In Christ, dividing walls are broken down. No Jew or Greek, male or female, slave or free, you are there on every spectrum, in every color, at every table. And so we trust that we can bring our prayers to you, knowing that you hear them and you respond to them. We give you thanks for the people who do the behind-the-scenes work at church and in the community. We give you thanks for volunteers who will be to help, who make socks for the homeless this week. And we give you thanks for love always. We bring our concerns and prayers for people with hurts, mental and physical, for Reverend James's cancer treatment, for gun violence in this country, for Russ's health concerns, for people that are hurting from the loss of loved ones, for Richard who needs Prayers for sleep, for homeless, for our elderly, for Paula's sister who's been moved to a new hospital as she recuperates from a stroke in Halifax, Nova Scotia. These prayers named aloud as well as those that we name silently now or aloud, we lift up to you. By your Spirit, God, make us one. By your Spirit, make us whole. By your Spirit, make this bread and wine your body and blood, that we may know communion with you and with each other. For we remember that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Then after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Holy God, take our hearts, our lives, our hands, mold us, change us, and send us out, that we may be your body in the world you so love, for the sake of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. All are welcome at this table. I invite our servers to come up and we'll commune by coming forward and receiving the, the bread and the cup and then returning to your seats by the side. Be the 
this is the body of Christ given for you. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the body of Christ given for you. Matthew, this is the body of Christ given for you. Jim, this is the body of Christ given for you. Mary. Sound the angels sing, the feast of ready to begin. The gates of heaven are open wide, and Jesus welcomes you inside. Sing with a thankful tone of glory light, come and reveal in rivers love and light. Take your place at the table of the King, as feasts of ready to begin. The feast is ready to begin. A table laden with good things. Oh, taste the peace and joy he brings. He'll fill you up with love divine. He'll turn your water into wine. Sing with thankfulness, songs of great delight. Come and revel in heaven's love and light. Take your place at the table of the king. The feast is ready to begin, the feast is ready to begin. The hungry heart he satisfies, offers the poor his paradise. Now feel all heaven and earth applaud, and raising goodness of the Lord. In faithfulness comes a birth of light, come and rebel in heaven's love and light. Take your place at the table of the king. The feast is ready to begin. The feast is ready to begin. I invite
invite you to pray our prayer after communion with me. Gracious God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. May we who share his body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us so that we and all your children shall be free and whole earth live to praise your name. Through Christ our Savior. Amen. Our hymn of commitment, I the Lord of sea and sky, or here I am, number 69. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. I, who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright, who will bear the light for them, whom shall I save? hearts for love alone. I will speak my word to them. Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. It is I, Lord. I have heard you calling in the night. I will go something a little different today. I invite you to face the narthex if you can. If you need to stay seated, just, you know, picture the doors in your mind. Because this is where we're being called. This is where we're being called to go out into the mission field of God, to spread what we have heard and felt and learned today, to make God's love known out there. So our time of blessing and charge today May it be a time of reorienting and revisioning for us as we go out into the world. May God bless you and keep you in your going out 
and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. Go forth into the world, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. We will. Thanks be to God. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsels guide upon you with his sheep seek your need fold you. God be with you till we 